Fantastic. Well, everybody, if you haven't haven't met you, my name is Luke Abbott. I'm the founder and CEO of V Driven. Um, I founded this company about five years ago to work specifically with um, emerging brands that just really weren't getting the attention from from service providers and investors and other people in the industry. Um, we have over 45 team members and all over the world and over 45 clients we work with. And uh, Sasha and Ken on this call are from our marketing team and they are the reason that we have these these events. I'm so grateful that they, actually Sasha had this idea of like, how do we, how do we help this community? Um, there's so much going on today relative to, I mean, I, I would call it a depression, if you if you will, <laughs> relative to funding in our space, at least based on a like traditional venture capital backed model. And it has decimated a lot of companies. Um, you know, hundreds, if not more companies have gone out of business over the last nine, 10 months. We're really trying to help everybody here and in our community to figure out like, how do, how do we have maybe a depression in terms of funding but but have us have it not affect us the same way. So we're we're not going down. We want to figure out the path to do that. And that's really the premise around today's today's um, panel. And I'm so grateful to have um, Emmanuel Storch, uh, Redima Aurora, and Alex Bear from their respective companies, Blackbird, Nia, and Genius Juice. Um, all of these these amazing leaders have taken alternative approaches to raising capital. And uh, it was actually Sasha's idea that we kind of really get you guys together, that we had this panel discussion. We give a chance for us to kind of discuss the paths that you took, help us understand what those paths look like, maybe some of the pitfalls and um, and also maybe some of the uh, tricks and trades, uh, tri tricks, if you will, on how to navigate these alternative ways of raising capital. Mm -hmm. So thank you everybody for joining. I'm going to dig in. And I think at the beginning here, it'd be great to kind of hear maybe a, a 60 to 90 second background from each of the uh, panelists. Uh, and let's start with Alex Bear. If you could tell us a, a bit more uh, about you and your company, um, and maybe in very high level, a couple of the alternative financing approaches you've taken, and then we'll go deeper during the panel discussion. Sure, sure. Um, well, thank you, Luke, and the Be Driven team for having me be part of this uh, really awesome panel to give back to the CPG community. So my name is Alex Baer. I'm the CEO co-founder of Genius Juice. Um, uh, we are based in Torrance, California. I live in Redondo Beach, uh, California, near, right nearby. Um, married for six years. We're actually celebrating our six-year anniversary tomorrow, so June 3rd. So we're excited about that. Still got to plan that out. And I do everything late. And we have a baby boy who's seven months old. So we're really less than happy. Um, so yeah, I've uh, been running Genius Juice for 10 years. It's a coconut smoothie brand. We have new wellness shots that are coming out in about a month or so that are nootropic based shots called the Genius Boost Shots. I've spoken with Luke about way in the beginning when we were uh, planning to launch it. Thank you and for the samples you sent me last week, Alex. They're delicious. Thank you. Thank you. And they're, they're obviously working because you're, you know, you're elevated. <laughs> you're elevated. <laughs> so, yeah, so we're uh, super excited about our innovation line. And as far as um, just funding, like Luke said, it's a tough environment right now. Crowdfunding um, is really a real uh, is a great way to go as long as it works well for your, your business and corporate structure. And there's creative ways to raise money. I've raised over one point six million dollars on crowdfunding between Republic and WeFunder. I have not used Start Engine yet, um, but they're also a good option. And uh, we've also raised on notes and other means of raising capital from angel investors. But um, crowdfunding has been really a big part of our funding and also our marketing. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that's genius juice. Awesome. Alex, thank you so much for the introduction. And Redima, what, what time is it where you're at right now? <laughs> we are at 12 in the night. Midnight. So so, oh, Redeemer, yes. Redeemer, <laughs> On a Friday me. night, I'm sitting here and giving a talk. <laughs> <laughs> oh my lord! I, I'm so grateful for you being here, and and, and in a second, I'll give you an opportunity to um, get, provide your introduction as well. But I, I really want we we actually operate with clients from all over the world, and I also was thinking with Redima that um, that you might bring some perspectives that we haven't even thought about here in the United States yet. So I'm really excited that you're here. If you could do some of your introduction, I, I'd, I'd love that. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. First of all, I think it's uh, it's great to meet people from all regions and um, you know demographics. Uh, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Rudhima Arora. I come from India in a very special part of India, which is Jammu and Kashmir. 
Um, it's also called the crown of, uh, of India. Um, technically, I am the third generation um, you know, who's doing this business, which is purely into Ayurvedic herbs. So what we essentially do is that we create these blends of herbs, which are all natural, have zero preservatives. You can have them in your daily lifestyle and you can heal your body from, you know, common issues like BP, cholesterol, thyroid, fatty liver, which, which have certainly become, you know, so, so common in our lifestyles. You know, it's, it's as common as stress that we, you know, usually take it for granted. And um, all of this ecosystem that I, that I built over a period of four years essentially came from the idea that why can't we heal ourselves on an everyday basis? And why do we have to depend on allopathy, which has extreme amount of side effects that nobody's really talking about. Um, I don't know how many, how many of you really understand the Chinese herbs and the effectiveness of it. But Indian ecosystem of Ayurveda, the so-called Ayurveda, which has a lot of natural herbs that can heal your body naturally, has these amazing benefits that have not been studied on a, on a global level as yet. And I think um, as yoga has become extremely popular, uh, I think around the world, I think Ayurveda is actually going to be the next big thing. And uh, maybe we'll, you know, hold the bandwagon there. And um, so this is a small introduction about us, you know, as we speak, you know, we are, you know, you know, we've started selling in US and, you know, I think selling globally is the only way forward from here. But coming back to the major point of funding that we were just discussing, I feel that um, honestly, I started bootstrapped. I did not take a penny from my family business or from my family funds that we had. And um, I think the simple fundamental that we used as a business strategy was that take a lot of patience in running the pilot well, right? Scaling up and, you know, consumer base is a secondary part of an effective business. But what stands for the fundamentals of the business is, are you profitable, especially as a consumer brand, are you profitable at the unit economic level? Right. So I think our aim was that let's create a repeat that saves us the marketing cost and make it profitable at the unit economic level. And whatever profits we initially had, we would you know get that in the business. And, you know, that's how we scaled the business initially. And of course, we used, you know, we, we used a few angel investors and then we went on to Shark Tank and raised about half a million from there. Um, but having said that, I feel that you know, uh, while the winter, uh, you know, winter is there and, you know, there's so much talk around funding that's happening right now. Evaluations have dropped drastically all mm -hmm. throughout. Um, I also feel that this is the best opportunity if you have the right business plan mm -hmm. because the funds are in the right reserves. They are just not letting loose because of the market uh, and, you know, where the market is right now. But if you have, if you are, a bit healthy, if you have a certain uh, scale to show, and if you have actually a model that you can convince people that it can scale, I, I think, you know, this is the best time to actually raise funds for, you know, for those reasons. But yes, yeah. invest a lot of time in your, in your pilot project and then only scale it up is, is what my, uh, you know, suggestion would be. But honestly, like, you know, uh, we, we've been approached by so many uh, you know, VCs. And I think those are still secondary parts of the business. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as we speak, there are numerous opportunities out there. Thank, thank you, Radhima. Thank you for the, for the introduction and congratulations on, on your success. And congratulations to all of our panelists today. You guys have been very successful raising capital. One thing I just want to maybe um, make sure I'm, I'm sharing with this group is what I'm hearing in the VC world is that if you think about a, a different series, like if I'm raising a seed round, an A, B, or C, there are no C's happening in the market right now. That market is dead. The B rounds are happening, but the valuations are down 50% from where they were just a year ago. We've had the biggest decline in valuations that's happened faster than has ever happened in the history of venture capital in the United States, at least. So it's a complete implosion that's happened on the venture capital side. There is money available. There are funds that have money, but accessing that capital is very difficult. 
And um, maybe for Emmanuel go, like one of the maybe number one things I wanted to communicate today is the best way to raise capital is not to spend the money on inefficient things. <laughs> so, and I think right. that you'll we'll maybe touch on this during our panel as well, because I know that's, that's a big thing for you is efficiency. So Emmanuel, with that, okay, I'm ready for your introduction. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Emmanuel Storch. I live in New York City. I'm the CEO at Blackbird Foods, where we make plant-based uh, restaurant quality products for the retail space. So we got started by manufacturing wheat protein, also known as seitan, for restaurants, which is a super versatile plant-based meat. Um, and we developed product lines for retail and launched in January 2020. So we now have three lines of products, one being our plain seitan, as well as our frozen plant-based hand-tossed New York style pizzas. And now we just launched our uh, new plant-based wings, which um, are rolling out into retailers now. So we're now in about 2,500 retail doors nationwide. We have raised funds um, both from VCs and have just recently launched our first WeFunder crowdfunding campaign, which I'm happy to share our experience with. And um, happy to answer any questions you have. We're probably um, don't have so much authority to talk to a lot of you guys here. We're probably a lot experiencing a lot of the same things, but I'm excited to share maybe what's worked for us and what hasn't worked for us. And hopefully you can have some learnings from that um, and also ways to, um, you know, like, like um, Luke was alluding to ways that we have saved and over time and have been able to reduce our burn, which ha we have found to be one of the most important factors in running our business right now um, during these hard fundraising times. So uh, yeah, happy to answer any questions that you have. Fantastic. It's uh, truly honored to have all of you here. We're going to dig into the panel questions now. Uh, we'll go for about 25 minutes of panel discussion. So I'll ask the panelists if we can be uh, crisp and uh, and and as short as possible with our responses to make sure we get in, we can get a lot of um, depth into this or a lot of um, coverage in it. And then ideally, we're going to have about 20 minutes at the end for um, the audience to ask questions. And that's usually where it gets uh, even more fun and interesting. So with that, I'll kick off the panel discussion and I'll start with a question to to Alex. Um, Shark Tank is so exciting. I just you know been watching it for years and I watched your episode recently. I watched your episode as well, reading on on the Indian version of the show, and I, I'm just what did it what did it take to get on the show? Like what what does that look like? And I'm I'm curious about the journey. And if you can maybe spend a couple of minutes sharing about that, I'd, I'd love it. Yeah, yeah. I mean that that's a an enormous question um, that I will condense down as best I can to uh, <laughs> a minute or two here. Um, <clears throat> so when we launched Genius Juice in 2014, that's when we wanted to. Uh, about a year in, we were like, okay, we want to pitch Shark Tank and go to the audition. So we went to the first audition, didn't make it. Second in Salt Lake City, didn't make it. Third in San Francisco, didn't make it. And I was ready to give up. And I'm like, you know what? Not three times a charm, but four times a charm. Let me go back. And it was at the Morongo Casino. I'm like, I used to play poker. I feel right at home. Cool. Let me go to Morongo. And so I auditioned there um, and I decided in the audit is very important because other brands are obviously auditioning and wanting to make it through the first hoop. You got to be really entertaining and larger than life and heartfelt and authentic and like not just nervous and in your own head. A lot of auditioners just get too nervous. So being just yourself, being fun, being open, you know, light about it. Uh, the judges remember you, you're memorable, and then you can get to the next stage. So once that happened, there was all these, you know, fast forwarding it, all these hoops, you send in a video. And then, and then by the way, this is pre pandemic. Um, I, I auditioned in 2019. So there was a lot in person. Um, you know, you would talk, you talk to your, your, your producer. That help you get on. And then uh, eventually what From there, um, you're basically, uh, you, you are, you know, maybe you're selected, maybe you're not. After the rehearsal, you do the taping. And then from the taping, there's a chance that they might not even air you, right? So there's issues there as well. So um, it's a long process, but I would say the more you can communicate uh, about your story, about your personal struggles, about why you created this product or service, 
that's really going to help you make it through all the different stages and you have to be memorable. And the last thing I'll say is you're noticing too with Shark Tank that the presentations are getting more ridiculous, right? <laughs> like they're getting more yes. entertainment, less about just talking and more about doing some kind of big, you know, dog and pony show. Feel slapstick at times. Yes. Slapstick. I mean, my friend who was on there a month, a couple months ago, um, the Sacha Inchi company, Brass Roots, oh, yeah. he had a, a band from New Orleans come out, do a full ensemble, mm. and then he was singing. He kind of took a page out of my book, which I did a song, right? I did a song, and we had dancers and singers. And so be memorable, um, you know, be yourself. Don't try to be someone else or try to over overplay your hand. And just have a really great story. And that's how you get on the show. And then there's obviously another story for another time, which is getting on the show, being, you know, what it felt like to be there during the taping. It was an hour long, the taping, and they condensed it down to 12 minutes. So like, there's a lot that you said that you say that never makes it. Uh, to there's a lot of stupid. I didn't realize that an hour. That's an hour condensed and felt you wouldn't know. I mean, the editing is amazing. You would never, ever know. And yeah. the other thing too, and you sign a contract is, and you have no power, um, you know, as far as the contract goes, which I can release this, you know, since I'm under NDA, but I can say this much, you sign something that says anything that I say, or that's done can be edited and moved around in any which way they want. So wow. I could say that's correct. That's correct. That one of their questions they can move it around and one of the sharks can say, Alex, you know, you're an idiot, right? And they can put that in and say, that's correct. You know, I mean, <laughs> so it, it makes people look worse than they really are. Sometimes it makes people look better than they really are. Uh, there's a lot of fancy editing going on there, but overall, okay. yeah, great, good, 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 ask a follow, quick follow up question. So would, would you, would you recommend it? Was it worth it for you and your brand? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, kind of a no brainer because of the exposure. I mean, it's, it's the downside is you don't get aired, right? And you spend all this time auditioning, going through all their paperwork, all the due diligence. I mean, it's lengthy. It took, I think two months to prepare all the paperwork for them. And just, they wanted information on what kind of wig I was wearing. Like, where did you get that from? Right. You know, is it yeah. copyrighted, you know, but once you actually get on the show and it's aired, whether there's a deal, whether there's no deal, it's obviously worth it for the exposure. I mean, we did, you know, almost a million in additional sales that year because of Shark Tank. So as long as you, they don't make you look, as long as they don't, they don't make you look like a complete fool or idiot, it's, uh, it, or they, and they don't say, don't buy this product. Like Mark Cuban doesn't say that. Um, yeah. It's going to be, it's gonna be <laughs> really good. It's going to be really good for your brand. That would be, that would be good. Not to have Mark Cuban say that about you. And then, and I think one of the things that, in our prep call that caught me off guard. And I don't know if you're able to share about it in the soldier group, but it, it isn't like what we see on the show actually happens. They, they say, hey, we're going to invest a half million dollars or whatever it is in you. There's a lot that goes on beyond that in terms of finalizing a deal. Are you able to share a little bit about that journey? Yeah. I mean, I can share that over 80% of all deals fall through that are made on the show. That's just a fact. Um, and it's because the contracts are, um, usually not in the favor of the entrepreneur, they're in the favor of the shark. And you have to also understand that when a shark is making a deal, especially Mark Cuban or Lori, whoever, they have all these deals going on at the same time with their legal team. They can't be doing special exceptions or special clauses in different contracts for different brands. They got to make it all streamlined, same contract across all brands. And you know what, if the brand doesn't like it, then there's no deal. So that's why so many deals uh, do fall through. And you don't really know that from watching the show, right? Thank you for, yeah, thank you for sharing that, yeah. And then um, also I just wanna share that um, Alex is, you're doing some consulting as well now, and you, if someone wants to go deeper into this subject about the, like the US Shark Tank, like they could talk to you about that, is that right? Um, the consulting is more on the crowdfunding side. Uh, Shark Tank, yeah. you know, I could, you know, help give you tips on how to do your pitch so that they remember you and all that. I'll do that for free, but uh, we, can get, we can get into it more on the crowdfunding side, but I do do consulting on the crowdfunding side. I help brand scale, raise more money, tips and tricks, toolkits. I, I'm consulting for brands right now 
but yeah, I can talk about it more as we get into that subject. Cool. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for that. And Renee, I'm, I'm curious in, in, in your case on Shark Tank, um, I think I believe you actually did a deal. And if you maybe want to share a little bit about that, um, if you're able to, and then I'm curious, did I think for you, did it drive sales? And then also did it drive even more curiosity from other investors in your business? That was a long right. question. So, you know, so first of all, I'll probably start with saying that um, the experience was very similar to what Alex was actually mentioning. It's the same process that happened for us. I think the only difference was that uh, Sony, uh, which was a production house, kind of reached out to us. And I think that happened because we had decent PR by then. You know, So I think we were in the business for about one and a half years. By the time you know, Shark Tank guys kind of approached us and um, we had decent PR. So maybe the first rule to them selecting you could be a visible PR because they ultimately want to create a bigger picture or a bigger story out of, you know, whatever business plan you have, right? So I think have a bigger purpose, right? And I, I, I'm assuming that most of us who start something have a bigger purpose, you know, beyond cars and crores and millions of money that we want to actually have, right? So I think that's the most important thing that, that needs to be in place. And uh, Alex rightly mentioned, I think there was, there was nothing different that happened in my episode. Um, the conversation happened for almost one and a half hours and what you see on the TV is almost 15 minutes. Um, and it's the same thing, you know, sometimes I would have said something and they would have just, you know, uh, post, you know, pasted a clipping where I'm just like not being able to respond. So that, that happens. But honestly, uh, there is no downside of going to Shark Tank. The only downside, as Alex rightly mentioned, is that if you're not here, because there's, there's actually a lot of time that goes in between. Right. But once you're once you're on air, it's free marketing. You're not going to get at least in the initial years of your of your startup. Right. So whatever comes for free, you know, like I think it always makes sense. Um, but other than that, you know, I think uh, I'm somebody who believes that if you're doing your business day in, day out, if you're really passionate about it. Um, I can't believe if you don't have your numbers in place. I think that's something that comes as the byproduct of, you know, having a good business. And I think that's what's exactly needed. And of course, you know, a little bit of drama because um, that's what it takes for anything to be on TV and, you know, look larger than life. And uh, I think as long as you're authentic and mm -hmm. you can tweak a little bit as per the production house, I think it's it's all fine. But I think... Having your numbers in place, irrespective of whether you go to a shark tank or not, you know, I think that's something that's non-negotiable in a business anyway. So, um, I yeah, I think I my tip would be only that, actually. We did a class on this recently about the importance of your numbers. And, um, yeah, so many, we come across, almost every company we come across, the numbers are not tight. And that can create a lot of problems when you're raising capital in any venue. Um, thank, thank you, Adina, for that. And, and. Um, I'd like to pivot a little bit into um, incorporating Emmanuel into the conversation as well. And uh, that's crowdfunding. And I, I'm really curious to hear some of your story um, and yeah, maybe some themes to touch on is like, you know, wh why you chose the platform you did, what was that platform, what was the process? Um, maybe I like Redimo was saying the numbers, how important was it that your numbers were tight and things as well. And then we'll also include Alex in the conversation as we go. So Emmanuel. Yeah, so our experience with with crowdfunding was that, um, you know, given the climate right now, our conversation with investors that we used to have, which were much more straightforward, it's the clear this the signs were clearly on the wall that um, things are different now, and so you know, looking for all alternative ways to fund your business and just keep things going uh, until maybe you can raise from VCs, maybe you won't have to. So. Um, we turn to crowdfunding. I would say there's a ton of learnings I've, you know, we've gone through since we decided to do it earlier this year. I barely even really knew what crowdfunding consisted of until we launched the campaign. So I'm happy to share some of that with you. Um, I guess for starters, just to get into it. Uh, uh, so we, we did on WeFunder. Um, it can be a convertible note, it can be a price round, it can be really almost any in, um, investing instrument, which I wasn't aware of before. So that's something that was really good to know, because you can still have your 
fundraising round open with, you know, your convertible note round, seed round open with other investors while you continue those conversations. And as long as you're offering the same terms to your, the WeFunder community, they, uh, you can have both going at the same time. Our personal uh, business attorney told, didn't even know that himself because he's never really done much with crowdfunding. So that was something we learned from WeFunder itself. So it's really helpful to get on a call with the platform you're working with and learn every, you know, ask all your questions there. Another piece is that you do have to have a, um, a lead, uh, financial review letter by a CPA that can take, that they file with the SEC and that can take up to six weeks of reviewed financials. So you going back to, um, Redeema's point about the numbers, like your books and everything, do you have to be very much organized because that is all checked over and submitted to WeFund or, or the platform in the SEC. So that's something you want to account for because you, even if you start raising money on the platform, uh, you cannot withdraw any money until that, that let, review letter is filed with the SEC. And again, that can take up to six weeks, uh, assuming you have everything in order. And, and then I want to clarify real quick, and, and just for anyone who's from the accounting background, there, there are these things called reviews and audits and re review can cost you $75,000. That's not what we're talking about here. This is just a CPA having reviewed your financials, I, I believe, right? And just kind of attesting that, a, a very minor attestment saying, yeah, this seems reasonable. Is that is that correct? Correct. Yeah. And so that, um, oh, Alex just shared our WeFunder page. Thank you. Yeah, Alex, um, sure. yeah so um, it wasn't for us a super rigorous process as you were alluding to it does cost money I probably I want to say maybe a few thousand dollars if I remember correctly to actually have a certified CPA do that review process and write write it do the right they do a full write-up um so there's that just to consider because we didn't realize you know that's another six weeks and if you don't have enough runway uh six weeks of runway that's an issue you'll probably run into just wanted to these are things people probably don't think about. Great tip. Um, Thank you for sharing it. Yeah. And then I would say the, yeah. So when you launch, when, you know, when you're launching your, your crowdfunding campaign, you know, obviously you want to make sure your deck that you can upload onto the site is really, you know, professional and well formatted and gets your point across. But also um, I think what we found is really important. I'll say a couple more things about it. One thing we found is really important is to make a, well-produced video so we've seen other brands who might try to shoot things on their iphone things like that you can get a film student we paid one for about six hundred dollars actually he, sorry he wasn't he's wasn't a film student but he did it for us kind of on the side of his film projects um who came in for a whole day did a bunch of shots did the editing and it really makes a difference when someone's seeing your brand for the first time and deciding to invest whether to invest in something that's professionally shot and really you know, portrays what you're building versus something that you might try to do yourself. That type of thing um, is probably hard to do yourself. So it's good to know when to turn to the professionals and when to do things yourself, because I am usually a really big advocate of trying to do things yourself in general. And then um, the other piece is like, how do you advertise your campaign? So the uh, a lot, once you launch your campaign, you're going to be inundated with consultants and marketers and digital ad people who are going to tell you how they're going to help blow up your campaign if you pay them x amount of money and what we have found in experimenting with paid ads to promote your campaign uh, and the like is that you're going to get the most traction from the your your fans already your custom your existing customers your linkedin community um, other people in your network friends and family versus the, you know, people who might stumble up upon an ad on, on Instagram. So I would say to save your marketing dollars when it comes to that and really focus on engaging your existing community and network. And, um, and yeah, I'd say one other piece that people don't realize is you do have to raise at least on WeFunder a minimum of 50,000 in order to withdraw any money at all. So that's called kind of like the friends and family round. They they call it to try to get to that 50,000. 
Um, and so if you don't raise 50,000, the money does go back to the retail investors. And so I would say if you're thinking of launching a WeFunder campaign or a crowdfunding campaign, it's good to, it's really important to make sure if, if you can get those committed commitments, you know, while you're still building the campaign, try to get people committed to investing or really have a plan in terms of how you're going to engage your community once you launch the campaign, because of course you want to hit that minimum threshold. Manuel, that, those are so many um, tips there that I think they're so beneficial for this community. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I also want to include uh, Alex in the conversation. And Alex, if you have any comments to what Emmanuel said, because I think you did a different um, approach um, in terms of the platform that you used. But I'm also curious, um, Alex, from your standpoint, how how working with crowdfunding could affect future VC investments and in, in your opinion on how VC, VCs look at it. And I have some thoughts on that too, but Alex, if you want to. Yeah, um, I'll start with your your last question first. Um, as far as like raising money, it used to be like like five years ago, four years ago, it was almost like frowned upon, right? To raise online, like, oh, they're desperate. They need money. They can't get money anywhere else. They can't get it from angels. They can't get it from VCs. So they're going to raise online. And I kind of got a little bit of that flack uh, three and a half, four years ago when we launched on WeFunder. Um, but we used Shark Tank as part of that as well. We, and we aired on Shark Tank, plus we had a campaign going. And uh, because our, our deal fell through for 500,000, we're like, let's raise 500,000 on WeFunder. Well, we raised 476,000. So we, we came pretty close to that at a, a triple the valuation that Mark Cuban offered us. So uh, in his face on You that. enjoyed that, didn't you, Alex? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it was good. Yeah. It was good. <laughs> yes. I, we enjoyed that. But, you know, love Mark Cuban, still orders the product, so nothing against him. So <laughs> when it comes to it, it was frowned upon, but there's been a lot of um, regulations that have come out from the government, from the SEC, called Reg CF. You can look it up, regulation crowdfunding. And they're really going more in favor of the company now. It's easier than ever to get on crowdfunding. There used to be this really arduous process to get approved. Now it's a lot easier to get approved as long as you have accurate financials and you keep your books clean. You're very, any of a brand that's actually um, selling or uh, has a great story, you're likely to be onboarded to either Start Engine, WeFunder, or Republic. And it's now seen, in, in, at least from my lens, that other investors do like it now, like other VCs in, in some cases, because they see it as a marketing tool as well. So you're getting your brand out there, you're getting it online. And I call them not, not only investors, but also investors, because those investors online, as long as you have an online product that they can order, they can become customers of your product. And so what we do at Genius Juice and we have over 3,000 investors between Republic and WeFunder. We did WeFunder first in 2020. We did Republic in 2021, where we raised 1.07 million and we maxed it and under Reg CF. And uh, all those people, we got their email, phone number, and physical address because they're investors. You have to get their information. That's the regulation. So now what we do is we have email marketing newsletters that say investor only deal. If you invested in Genius Juice, you get ongoing 20% off, you know, once a month and you can redeem it whenever you want. We have those email drips that are going out constantly. And who's going to want to buy your product more than your own investors, right? They're your biggest fans, as Emmanuel was alluding to. One thing I want to also, because there's so much information that can be shared, is that um, I know WeFunder has this. I don't know, you know, and I consult my clients on this, that Emmanuel's right. It takes six weeks to me is um, it could be even more, right? It could be eight weeks because everyone's backlogged, right? Because everyone's wanting to raise now on crowdfunding. It's more popular than ever um, that it may, it, you know, it takes a while to get your, um, your financial review filed. WeFunder has a program where you can raise up to $124,000 without a financial review. It's a new thing. I think it's been around, but it hasn't really been promoted. And so um, if you would like to get there faster, you can actually do a private round. So you have your link, you can send it to anyone you want, your email list, your customers, put it on the QR code on your packaging in a store, and you can do up to $124,000 without a financial review. But 
if you want to get the money out, you have to file your Form C. So, and the Form C is something that can be filed by WeFunder. They file it for you. Um, so that's that's a way around it. You just have to have accurate internal financials to raise the first 124,000. Um, so there's a lot of strategies there. And then there, it goes into how do you grow it, the marketing behind it. I mean, I'll you know piggyback what Emmanuel said. Having a great video is half the battle because what we've learned from social media, people are reading less. It went from it went from Facebook text to Instagram images to TikTok videos. People love videos. They love stories. And having a great video, like we did a rap video on our WeFunder. If you Google WeFunder Genius Juice, I dressed up as Einstein with my dad's doctor coat. And I had Benjamin Franklin, myself, and Leonardo da Vinci all dressed up, all geniuses, yes. doing, a rap, doing a rap song. And it was so ridiculous, but it did really well. So being very entertaining, and then going back to Shark Tank, entertaining, but also your campaign page needs to be really dialed in. It's got to be short, to the point, great imagery, great images that really paint a picture to your growth. And I will say this too, it's really important to mention because I, I don't want to ramble too much here. There's a, there's a model that WeFunder does, which is becoming more and more popular called the revenue-based financing model. It's called the RBF model. Republic has it too. A lot of these platforms never marketed it. They just marketed raise on equity, raise on safe note, which I recommend safe note because there's no interest accrual or raise on convertible note. The RBF model, I think is really, really attractive because it's getting harder and harder to raise money as a CPG brand because investors have no idea when they're going to get their money back. It could take 10 years, right? Like Kind Bar, right? Or 15 years, Justin's, to get their money back. So this RBF model, this revenue-based financing, the way that it works, instead of actually just raising money and people get equity, people invest on this RBF, this revenue-based financing model, and um, they are basically loaning the company money and the company promises to pay back 2X of what they invested in over five years. Wow. And, there's, and there's no equity. So okay. you get 100% back in five years, you get 20% per year, right? Return, ARR. Yeah. And so uh, that's becoming a popular model now because- So much sense. Cause you're right, it's like the the the- you think a decade or two or never to get your money back as an investor. That's amazing. Yeah, it's kind of like you're gambling. And again, there's there's good gambles, which could pay off. But the reality of it, it's taking longer and longer to have an exit. And a lot of brands are reshaping their model where there may never be an exit. Maybe they're just going to grow a profitable business over. We're, seven, eight, nine, we're eight. seeing that more and more. The model has changed. Everyone's talking about gross margin and how do we build sustainable businesses right now? And which means you're right. Investors may never see anything at that point, especially safe holders, right? Um, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, you have something on paper with the business, you have equity or a safe note. Your safe note may never even convert over to equity because- right, it may not. If you don't do a, a priced round ever, then it may not happen. And the safe note is to the advantage of the company because- okay. There's no provisions on having to convert over. There's no maturity date and there's no interest. So if you're going to do a note round, do a safe note because it's a big advantage to uh, the company. But you may discourage investors from coming in because for them waiting all this time, there's no interest accrual on their investment. So the RBF model with WeFunder, I'm more than happy to introduce you to my man, Justin Renfro at WeFunder. I think, uh, Emmanuel, you, you probably... I've heard our talk to Justin at some point at WeFunder. He's a great guy in San Diego, and he's really pushing the revenue-based financing model because it's more likely that you, you have everyone else doing equity or notes, and you have this one company doing, no, we're going to pay you back yearly, and, and we're going to pay you back 100% return, 200%, you know, your money back plus 100% over five years. And every single quarter, you get mailbox money, right? Which makes like sense. That. I like that. Thank you for sharing. I'd never heard of that before. And I think that's going to be very valuable for our community. Thank you, Alex. I, um, Renima, it's like, it's like 1242 in the morning. I had to keep you awake over there. Um, <laughs> I, one, maybe one more question for you, and then I'll, we'll go into um, questions from the audience. And I see them coming in through the um, chat box. Thank you for sending them, everybody. Um, Renima, I'm, I'm curious in terms of 
as you were thinking about raising capital or as you were talking to investors, I know you, I think you do D to C direct to consumer and you also do yes. retail stores. At one point in the United States, it was like, oh, retail mattered more than D to C. I'm now seeing D to C become more important. And I'm curious what you're seeing in terms of um, running your business, what investors are telling you right now. You know, so I think um, in India, I'm going to give you a context of India where, of course, consumerism is at all time high and, uh, you know, internet has of late, you know, like literally like went into tier three cities and villages like anything, right? I think um, it, it's a great time from an internet age perspective in India. Um, but having said that, uh, you know, if I if I were to look at the journey of the D2C brands that kind of started back in, you know, 2014, 2013, right? So um, D2C definitely is a great initiator, you know, because, you know, your fixed costs are bare minimum, uh, you know, the capital expenditure, you know, which is typically needed initially, you know, goes literally to zero. But having said that, um, I think it's it's only a way to initiate an FMCG business because I think a lot of consumerism, a lot of customer is actually sitting in the retail, right? So while D2C could be a great initiator for your brand, it can't replace the look and feel that you get, um, you know, for a brand, especially in the retail, especially for a brand like ours, which is a slightly sensitive um, product and category, right? If if I were to go go to the market and buy a supplement, I'm actually going to check ten brands before I buy something like that, right? So for us, we've kind of understood that it almost takes like seven days for somebody to make a decision on the product, which is almost similar to the smartphone category vis-a-vis -vis somebody who has to buy a cookie or a or a candy or or something in the similar space. So I think um, um, in India, what we are seeing is that. A lot of, you know, these brands after turning, you know, 50 million, 50, 55 million, you know, they had to kind of shift to the retail and um, uh, you can't ignore retail, especially I can talk about India. I think you can't ignore retail because um, consumerism and almost 80, 85 percent of consumerism is still sitting there. Yeah, no, I think right? that's so, so that's my, yeah. yeah. I think, thank you. And I'm, I'm thinking of companies like Magic Spoon in the U.S. that started D2C and built out tremendous business and were able to raise capital and then went into retail. And they, oftentimes companies are, are profitable in the D2C side, not, not with refrigerated product, like um, some of the people who are represented in this call today, but if you're if you're a product that can be shipped efficiently, um, you know, D2C isn't wrong. And I'm finding that investors are, are valuing profitable business. So D2C <laughs> profitable business versus just non-profitable retail business. So a nice blend can be really good as, as my- Absolutely. Opinion. I think D2C, uh, irrespective of your D2C or you are another brand, I think profitability is what's going to matter. And especially at the unit economic level, that's going to matter in the next five years, I feel. Yeah, I think so too. I agree. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the, thank you panel for for this part of the, the meeting. Now let's sort of shift into questions from the audience. And uh, Chris, um, one of the coolest new products on the market, Bucket of Bread, where you can- uh, you can actually like uh, make bread at home in a bucket that he'll send you. It's a really cool product. And Chris is an amazing guy. Thank you for being here, Chris. You asked, um, at what point do you know when you can ask for crowd fundraising? I'm thinking that's probably like the size of company. And Emmanuel, let me give you a shot at that question. If you have an idea of what that number would look like. I think probably any size. You'd, you definitely want to show some sort of traction in historicals in terms of you know how you've grown uh you know what's what alex alluded to is on crowd on crowdfunding you want to show like that upward trending arrow as an image um so being able to show that you have traction and um upcoming launches and uh, you know things like that i i don't know if there was a, if there would be a revenue size um that i could speak to but just really probably that you probably do want some traction knowing in some trial whether you've put it on Amazon or anything just to show that you have some sales. Okay, that sounds good. Thank you. And Alex, I want to give you a shot at that question too. Like if you, what, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, just echoing, I think Emmanuel and I are really aligned on a lot of this feedback for crowdfunding that you don't want to, you know, you know, you got your shot, right? You don't want to, you know, that's a really valuable silver bullet. You want to use that at the right time um, when you know you have the right traction 
sales, something new, like, oh, you know, new innovation, or you know that there's going to be a big new retailer coming later in the year, right? And they have, they have approved your product because you can post updates on your crowdfunding, right? To all your investors and followers. So having sales traction or big milestones happening, that's going to really increase revenue and scale you quickly is really exciting to investors. And they're more likely to hop on in and say, you know what? I was on the fence before about this, this, mm -hmm. uh, you know, vegan pizza, but man, they're launching in the thousand new doors this year or this month. I'm yeah. in, I'm going to invest, yeah. right? Reasons to believe, Alex, reasons to believe. Reasons and to believe. And, um, having a, and I think what I heard too is, I think Emmanuel and Alex, you said it, because Chris is like, I'm super tiny. I'm like a seed just getting started. And it's like, well, you also may not have much of a community to reach out to yet also, right? So I think there, there's like this, probably the sweet spot. You know, if, right. maybe, Emmanuel, I'll give you a shot. So you shake your head. There's probably this sweet spot that could be, hey, I have thousands of Instagram followers. I have, you know, is that kind of like some kind of a metric you would think of in your head, Emmanuel? Yeah, definitely. I mean, look, like maybe Alex here who has a lot of big LinkedIn fo following, like, you're, for example, you could build your network on LinkedIn, not have too much traction on sales yet. It's, obvious, it's not an easy thing to do. I haven't done it myself, but not have too much traction on your actual retail sales yet, but really have that community behind you show that, you know, give previews of what you are launching. It's probably a case by case basis, but um, yeah, definitely having uh, some sort of community that you can advertise it to. I do think if you probably launched a product on on WeFunder without having any sort of way to market it or, or audience, I don't think it would go anywhere. Um, it'd probably be, you'd have to be really lucky, I think. Um, there's definitely a lot of work that goes into your WeFunder campaign. It's not, definitely not the easy way out. <laughs> but um, <laughs> what I would also say is don't also don't underestimate the WeFunder or any, sorry, I keep saying WeFunder, but really crowdfunding retail investor community, because a lot of them are investors themselves. A lot of them are really smart and can write sizable checks. Um, so it's not just hundred dollar checks that come through. Sometimes there are funds who will invest in your, in your WeFund, in your crowdfunding campaign. And so taking that into account and really, um, yeah, putting, using thinking of them as your audience too and making sure you have strong business fundamentals and strong you know growth traje trajectory um everyone is going to want to see that in your campaign got it what if i uh i'm not yeah, please, go ahead, uh, something because this is a really good topic i mean we had a one investor that um lives in carson california and he buys genius juice at whole foods all the time the one in torrance off pch Perfect. And um, so he came in one day and he saw a little bottle tag with the QR code on there, invest in Genius Juice. And I think, you know, what Emmanuel was also saying is like, you know, you never know who could invest, who could cut you a $10,000 check or a $50,000 check or even a hundred. Yeah. And so I started talking to this gentleman and I think that really gets into segues into every person counts mm -hmm. when it comes to crowdfunding because you never know who's going to write a bigger check. You don't know what's in their bank account. You don't know what they're capable of writing. And this individual, this is a guy that to me, when I first spoke with him was blue collar. Like he's like, oh yeah, I work near the port and blah, 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 blah. But then I come to find out he's a longshoreman. So he's wealthy. <laughs> so he's wealthy. And this is 2020. Okay. When goods were, pandemic. they were so, he was working double, triple shift. Every time I spoke to him, he was on his way to Long Beach in his car, like yeah. middle of the night, morning out, he was going to the, to the, to the port during the pandemic, right. Cause of the unforeseen demand. And he's probably, I mean, he didn't tell me, but we're talking 300,000 a year, you know, at that time. And so he put in a check for a hundred thousand on our WeFunder campaign because he's been following us for years. Yeah. He spoke to me. Uh, I, as a founder, made the time to speak to him and have a phone call. You know, I tried to meet up with him in person. I couldn't even meet up with him in person. That's how busy he was. And he was 10 miles. He's five miles from me. So it goes. You want to keep focus making money, Alex. So yeah, don't, yeah. You don't exactly. need to <laughs> I don't want to stop him from that, you know. And so even for lunch, he's like, I don't have time for lunch. So getting to people, having the conversations, doing the work. If you cannot sign up to make 20 calls a day, 40 calls a day, texting, 
following up, having a lead system where you really are tracking each and every person. When did you last talk with them? When did you last text them? When's the next follow-up date? What do they tell you? How much can they invest? Like having that kind of level of detail and grit and persistence is what it really takes. And it's, it's not easy. Like it's not easy to raise from, you know, it's easy to raise from a, your brother or sister, but when you start going out to your colleagues and your network and LinkedIn, you really have to follow up and be persistent. So all that hard work is what's going to jumpstart your campaign and being on phone calls. I was on phone calls nonstop for two and a half months every day for two or three hours to raise half a million dollars. That's what it takes to do that. I wanted to share, like, I think Emmanuel and Alex here both sharing is like this, this sounds like this panacea, check a box, go raise money, but it's like, no, there's a lot of work. There's a lot of investment of time and effort and even money um, in terms of like that review letter, for example. So thank thank yeah. you for sharing that. I, I want to make sure you get through some of the other questions here. Um, and then we'll hit Redeema on this one first, and then Alex will take you second on this one. Um, Robert uh, mentions he's heard of some brands' websites collapsing or having inventory problems from the promotion from Shark Tank demand surge. Can you speak to preparation for this? And uh, Redeema, if you could take, take that first, what happened to you? We had a very funny experience, honestly. Um, it was first season in India, and we had absolutely zero clue of what this is going to be or how. What kind of impact are we going to see? And um, you know, usually they they told us that you know you should at least keep three x of your regular sales number with you in stocks wherever you know your warehousing. And India is huge, and we have almost six warehouses across the country. And um, so we prepped ourselves, you know, as per that. Uh, and that was a simple phone call that happened to us that okay, you know, you should prep at least two to three times of your stock. And we kind of maintained that, you know, when, when we were intimated that it's going to be a and so and so date. Um, but to my surprise, it actually went almost 10x. Um, our website blew off in like a minute, the moment it was uh, broadcasted in the night. I still remember it was 9.30 in the night. And um, we had to, I, I remember we did not sleep that night because, you know, we had to get more bandwidth for the website and we had to, you know, you know, let it up in, in the next 10, 15 minutes. Um, we were almost 22 people working in the night and, you know, figuring out how to keep up things. Um, morning, um, first slot, we had not seen that kind of order volume ever. And uh, I remember hiring 12 people in six days. And that's the most number of people I've ever hired in my life in such a short span of time. And we were doing so. We, we do the manufacturing ourselves so we were, instead of having one shift in the day, we were actually having three shifts. And the factory was running for 16 hours continuously for the next, um, you know, two months. And we were literally like delayed for one order by seven days, which is like huge. Um, but I think crazy experience, amazing experience. And he's absolutely right when he says that the websites actually get down. Because for us, it did. And, uh, you know, we really had to keep up. So just in case you're going to be on Shark Tank, have at least, you know, 10 to 15 people extra in your manufacturing team and get prepped up for sleepless nights. <laughs> Radeva, thank you for sharing that. that. Congratulations. That sounds like it was a tremendous success. And your products are more shelf stable. And I'm curious for Alex, because I know you do an online business as well, but you're doing refrigerated, much more expensive to ship. Uh, what happened to you? Yeah, I mean, we we charged a lot of money for a bottle. I mean, we charged seven dollars and fifty cents for a bottle that cost four ninety nine in retail. And uh, you know, at the time, um, this three PL we no longer use. It was before they got acquired. Thank God, because before they got acquired, they were amazing and hands on. And the owner would call you like, "Dude, I just saw you in Shark Tank, and like, we're gonna get this ready, and we're gonna fulfill these orders, these orders. all that stuff." So. It, it, it's, I mean, if there's a way to ship shelf stable or freeze it and ship it where it, it thaws in transit without ice packs, without all the weight, this is just a side kind of thing. Go that route, please, because it's just so freaking expensive. And then when you mark it up so much, you see this, right? There's very successful refrigerated brands like Koya, Vive, Harmless Harvest. Yep. They're struggling because they have to charge so much 
to just ship their product. And then also there's a lot of spoilage issues. You know, if it doesn't get there in two days, it goes bad. And then the customer blames you. you genius juice, what the hell? I'm like, no, it was the FedEx guy who threw it on the wrong porch. It wasn't us. So, but needless to say, I remember, you know, not to get into deep stories, but I went to fancy food show the day after Shark Tank. And I couldn't, it was in San Francisco before they moved it to Vegas. Yeah. And if you ask anyone, if they saw me, I wasn't smiling and saying hello and, and hugging them. I was <laughs> in the corner on my laptop and phone, just trying to handle all this. So yeah, that's, it's that, a good, that's, problem, that, good problem that's my story of just handling that and n never go to a trade show the day after. You yeah. know. No, poor, poor, poor planning, but, but amazing results. So <laughs> So guys, um, we're almost to the end and I would like it to be very brief and I'm maybe give every one of the panelists a, maybe a two sentences to kind of close uh, any, any final thoughts for this group. Um, maybe starting with um, Emmanuel, if you would kick off, that would be great. Yeah, sure. Again, thank you for having me today. It's always um, fun talking about this and hearing other people's stories as well. Um, I would say one thing that Luke, you touched on at the beginning Obviously, fundraising um, is almost necessary, most usually necessary in, in starting a business these days and, and growing a business, but finding ways to drive your margin up and cutting costs yes. is what's more important right now is what it's, it's what investors are looking for um, from all parts of the industry. And Agreed. Uh, you know, it's what you will lead to the longevity and health of your business. And there's a lot of ways to grow fast by spending a lot of money, but you're not guaranteeing yourself, you know, longevity or security in your business or having to give a lot of it away. Um, it's, it's very hard to do in practice, I will say, but keeping your head down and focusing on that, um, I think will get you pretty far or it should get you pretty far. So that's also something to really take into account it's okay to grow slowly and organically and preserve, um, you know, your business that way. Manuel, well said and 100% agree with you. Thank you again for being here. Alex. Yeah, um, I'll make it as short and sweet as I can, even though I do talk a lot. Um, so yeah, I think just be sustainable. Margins are really important. All those things. Addition by subtraction, like look at your budget. You know, if if something doesn't make sense, it's not it's not providing ROI or it's not the right timing for the partnership with that vendor. Just cut it and you can always come back. Um, you know, we've, we've cut our budget 75 percent and you might lose some sales if you cut your marketing or promotions. But at the same time, at least you'll survive. You'll have a business and you can be profitable. That's what it's about right now. That's what it's about right now. Alex, very well said. Thank you. And Redima, um, you have a couple of sentences to kind of close this out. Thank you for being here, um, everybody. Go I ahead. think three quick things. Um, I think whatever we've learned first for a D2C brand like ours or for a consumer brand like ours, I think um, being profitable at the unit economic level is very important. Um, more than scale, retention and um, customer experience kind of becomes very, very critical. Scale can come at any given point of time, I think it's it's proportional to how much you're spending after a certain stage of your startup. Uh, so wait for it, don't be in a rush. And third would be, uh, you know, run, uh, my suggestion would be that I think the most amount of learning I had was when I actually ran it bootstrap. Um, because I think that's the time when I found the most creative ways of using the money. So, I am assuming you can have that time at any given stage of your startup, but have that time, you know, so that you can think through your creative juice as well. So yeah, mm. those three things. And, you know, patience maybe because uh, businesses today are a game of patience. It is mm -hmm. well said. And, and I know you're coming from an Indian perspective, but that's the same thing in the U S you're exactly right. That applies here today as well. I, um, am extremely grateful for the panelists and for the attendees today. Thank you everybody for being here. This is a very germane subject for this moment in our in the history of our of our industry, and you know, part of this what we're doing today is pulling together um, as an industry to support each other. And I'm truly grateful for all of that, um, all the learnings and all the tips that were shared today. 
Um, we'll have a follow-up email that'll be coming from from my team. Um, be an opportunity if anybody wants to spend a little bit of time um, with me talking about this further to set up some time on my calendar and, and happy to have conversations after this call and continue to support you guys any way we can. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Luke, Thank for you having us. Appreciate it. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.